It's making sure it's live. Hello, everyone. If you can let us know this is working, you can comment that we're actually live since this is our first time doing this in quite a while. So my name is Mike Keenitz, and today we have Rick Olderman, who is a physical therapist on, and we're going to be talking about his new book, Solving the Pain Puzzle, as well as taking some live Q&A questions. So we are live on Bob and Brad's Facebook. We are live on Rick's Facebook group and Rick's YouTube channel as well. So, Rick, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where we get going? Uh, sure, Mike. Uh, I'm a physical therapist. Uh, by default, it seems I've had to focus on chronic pain because that made up the majority of the patients I seem to see. And over the years, um, I have developed a unique approach to solving chronic pain. And, uh, hopefully, and that's what I kind of talk about in my book, Solving the Pain Puzzle, and which is uh, on a special reduced price right now. Uh, there, everyone should have been sent a Google link, or maybe that's in your Facebook group. I'm not sure, Mike, uh, for a special reduced price just during this, uh, live event. Um, but anyway, I, I've been a PT for over 25 years and we're going to be talking about what makes my approach different. That's what my book talks about, how I've helped a lot of people using this new approach. It's, uh, it's more comprehensive yet simpler and, uh, much faster than uh, typical approaches. Oh, I have someone from Florida watching. Hello, from hello, Susan from Florida. Uh, so we're going to be talking about his book first, and then we'll get into some questions and answers from you, the audience. Some people submitted them via email. Some people signed up for a prize from Rick. So we'll be spinning a wheel later to give some prizes out as well. And we're going to be running for about an hour. So if you have questions, kind of prepare them. And once we get to that section, start asking. So Rick... You want to talk about your book a little bit first? Sure, sure. Love to talk about it. Um, yeah, so I wrote another series of books many years ago called the Fixing You series. And I, those have been on Amazon for almost 15 years now. And uh, those explain like the, the nuts and bolts of, of the mechanics and the muscles and the joints and so forth. But in those books, I have these little client connection stories where, you know, I talk about a specific patient that I've helped using this technique or yeah, this approach. And so over the years, I've gotten so many comments from people saying, hey, I, I identified really with that one client, you know, Debbie in that book and so forth. And so I've gotten so many comments. I thought, you know, let's just turn this whole thing on its head and maybe write about the people I've helped and how I've helped them instead of going into all of the nitty gritty of the anatomy biomechanics. So you can see it might be an easier way for people to understand how this approach would solve their pain. And I truly believe it will solve their pain. Uh, and so this is because a lot of people aren't medically oriented. So this is a, a, a gentler way of easing into this information about this new approach that I've created. Sure. And then you also have program books as well, like we mentioned, an online program. So where can people find that information from you? Yeah. So uh, people can get this new book as well as all of my I, I've created digital home programs to help people solve pain. I've got a free ebook. I've even created a program to train practitioners in this approach. And that's all found at uh, www.rickolderman.com. Uh, my last name is Olderman. <laughs> opposite of younger woman for those who don't know <laughs> it is on the screen for people that are watching oh yeah we have, we have okay. people tuning in from all over the states and in australia and ireland boy they're all over well, hey, welcome, Allison. Good welcome to see you. from abroad i should say so rick do you have a question you want to go over from the previous questions that were submitted by email that you'd yeah, like to answer so, first you know i i've i've Gotten all, I've gotten over 600 questions, Mike, <laughs> just in a couple of days uh, from, uh, you know, putting out the email about all this stuff. And this, this, there's two th comments I want to make about this. One is that I shouldn't have over 600 questions. <laughs> if we were doing well in medicine and solving chronic pain, I shouldn't be getting 600 plus questions in just a couple of days from people who are struggling with their chronic pain. And I want you all to know that those of you who are struggling, you're not alone. All right. There's a lot of people out there. And so a lot of people are falling through the cracks of our medical system. And I, and I really believe it's not so much cracks anymore. It's more like huge canyons. And there are just legions of walking wounded out there of people who are struggling with their pain. So that was my first comment about just the volume of questions I've gotten. The other thing that I wanted to comment on about all these questions is that 
they're all coming from a component thinking standpoint. And I talk about what component thinking is in my book and how my approach, which is more systems thinking, is much different than how we've been trained in medicine. So many people are talking about specific joints or specific tissues or, you know, like SI joint pain or piriformis syndrome or occipital, occipital, occipital neuralgia or, you know, all sorts of very specific, you know, lateral epicondylitis. These are all questions based on component thinking, which is you've been to practitioners who are drilling down and looking specifically at which tissue is injured. And so their, their focus has been on treating that tissue typically to make it heal, right? But what their approach is not taking into consideration is why that tissue is damaged in the first place. We don't have a single test in medicine that talks about the why behind pain. And that's what I found is the secret to solving chronic pain. Component thinking basically just means that we look, we we're trained in medicine and we have a, a thousand different tests to identify specific tissues. We have x-rays, we have MRIs and so forth that identify specific tissues that are damaged. These are the components that are damaged, but that's where the thinking stops. It says, okay, now we'll treat that systems thinking takes into account how the body works and what you're doing that's creating that damage in your body. And so that's what my book talks about. And, you know, I want, I wrote it to give people hope that they can solve their pain because this is so significantly different than how they've been addressed so far. And these questions prove it over 600 component thinking questions because what they're, all of those practitioners are missing is a systems approach to understanding and solving pain. Sure. So it's more or less getting to the root cause of the problem versus just looking at the isolated incident. Well, I, 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 I'm reluctant to say it like that, Mike. And the reason is, is that I don't think you'll run into any practitioner. I just lost my window. Oh, oh I can still go. see you. <laughs> it, went, it went asleep. So I don't think there's any practitioner who has treated these people who doesn't think that they're getting to the root cause of problems. I can't imagine a practitioner saying, you know what? I think I'm going to skip the root causes. We're just going to treat that tissue. I, I think everyone believes they're getting at the root causes. The problem is, is, they, is that what they believe is the root cause is more of this component thinking. They think, oh, that lateral epicondylitis, that's your extensor, you know, digitorum, you know, longus. Oh, well, we're going to get at that. Well, yes, that is what the component is, but it's not a systems approach to solving it. So I'm reluctant to use root causes because everyone uses that term. And so everyone's heard that term before. I choose to use systems thinking. And on, so that's much different than uh, it, uh, while it addresses the roots, it, it's, it's much more expansive than understanding things from a root cause. Sure. So are you ready to get into some of these questions from our audience? Oh, I'd love to. So the first one I have is from Rose Z. So she asks, how do you exercise for osteoporosis if you have a spinal fusion from T3 to S1? Yeah. So uh, was that name Rose? Did you say? Mike? Yep. Okay. So Rose, uh, first of all, I, I wonder if you're suffering with pain. And so the first step is first to eliminate the pain. So and I've, I brought my little skeleton buddy here to help demonstrate some things. So Rose, what I would ask you to, to do, let's, let's assume Rose that you have back pain of some sort. So that was uh, T3, did you say Mike? T3 to L5, was that the fusion? Uh, yes, I believe so, uh, T3 uh, to S1. T3 to S1, okay, so T3 way up here to S1 is Rose's spinal fusion. I'm assuming that Rose is having pain. All right. So uh, what the one of the key uh, patterns behind almost all back pain is that of too much, too many forces trying to pull the spine into more arching or more extension. And so a really easy way to figure this out, if this is the source of your pain, is if you lie down with your legs straight for 30 seconds and feel how comfortable your back is, and then simply bend your knees for another 30 seconds, your back should feel much better with your knees bent than with your legs straight. 
So if your back feels better, what's happening is your back is flattening, right? That's the easy answer. So what's really happening though, is you're removing the forces from your legs that are acting on your pelvis and spine that are causing your pain. So the first answer to your question would be Rose, first understand why you're having pain. And you've got fusions from T3 to S1. So really there shouldn't be any movement in this area, but you'll notice that even with that fusion, your back should feel much better with the knee spent because you're not changing the motion of the vertebrae, you're changing the forces that are acting on it. And the way I like to describe that is, uh, Mike, if, like if I pushed on, on your chest really hard with one finger and you pushed back and neither of us moved, that's because movement hasn't happened doesn't mean there isn't any force generated. And so that's the same thing as these forces that are coming from your legs, your spine doesn't have to move in order for that force to do damage to that spine. So my first answer to that, Rose, would be then to solve the reasons you're having pain in the first place. After you solve that, the solutions that you have that solve your pain will be the same vein of solutions you will have to your exercise program. Because you do not, the things that will solve your pain are the things that you should be incorporating into the exercise program. So that's a, a tricky way of me not really answering your question, but really answering it more deeply than maybe you're, you're asking. So I'm going to try to see if this question pops up in here. Oh, perfect. So hey. Kendra Pride has a question. She's dealt with low back pain and buttock pain, primarily SI joint for about two years. Such an annoyance. Um, she's due for an injection in two weeks. So I'm guessing she's asking what she can do to help with this. Yeah. So uh, same. So this, this is exactly what I was talking about, Mike, before. These questions are geared towards component thinking ideas, all right? Low back pain is a component diagnosis. The same pattern that's causing, for instance, low back pain in rows might be causing SI joint pain in you or sciatic pain in another person. And the reason it's manifesting differently is because of how you're built, your exercise history, your sports history, your work history, your emotional trauma, your dietary issues, all sorts of reasons why that might show up as back pain in one person, SI joint pain in, a, in another, and sciatic pain in a third. So the same question that I just gave for Rose in terms of identifying the basic pattern behind your pain would be where I would begin to, to help you. I would do that test, legs straight, and then knees bent. Knees bent, almost guaranteed, 99.9% .9 of the people out there will say that their back feels better when their knees are bent. So what that's telling you is that you're doing things that are causing your back to be more arched. If you eliminate those things that are causing your back to be more arched, then your back pain will resolve. Almost guaranteed. It happens almost all the time. So regardless of the structural diagnosis. So this isn't a question, but I thought it was a good statement. So Susan Hales says, I've been using Rick's program for my hip pain for three weeks and it's already improved. So. That's great, Susan. I'm so happy to hear it. Thanks. Thanks for commenting. And uh, I did not pay Susan to, to write that. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, I, I really expect results even faster than that. So I expect results to happen within a week. Uh, for most people that you should see almost immediate changes in your pain. And so this is the beauty of uh, addressing things from a system standpoint is because you're not only addressing the tighter, weak muscles, you're addressing the habits that are causing the tighter, weak muscles. When, and then I, in my programs, I offer off, also offer taping techniques to support your body until you can fix those habits in tight or weak muscles. So pain can be eliminated very, very quickly. I don't care whether it's been around for 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter. You're because the system of issues that it's causing your pain has not been resolved yet. And my program will help you resolve that very quickly and help you see exactly what's going to solve your pain. So Susan, I'm happy that your pain is feeling better. 
let's go for even faster results now. <laughs> I will just make a comment for our people asking questions. Rick is a physical therapist, so it has to be more PT related questions. Um, there's some medicine stuff and diet. So I just wanted to clarify, it's going to be more PT related questions. Yeah. So Gail asks neck and shoulder pain and Dowinger's hump. So I'm guessing she's having problems with that. Yes. So, oh gosh. Well, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce this, uh, Mike, but Bob and Brad and myself are working on a joint book together and neck pain and dowager hump correction is in that book. So we're hitting all, all things from head to toe. So for sure, you'll get your answer there, but I'll give you the quick and dirty answer right now, Gail. All right. So the, the big secret behind almost all chronic neck pain and headaches is that the fault is due to shoulder blade function. And there are significant muscular attachments from the shoulder blade into the neck bones and the base of the skull. When the shoulder girdle system isn't working well, stress is transmitted via those muscles to the cervical spine and the base of the skull. I developed a special test to determine that. And it's a very quick and dirty, easy test. But basically, this is, and most, almost all people who have neck pain and headaches have never had anyone address their shoulder blades as the potential source of the problem. And that's because, again, this goes back to this component thinking idea. Oh, you've got neck pain? We're going to look right at that neck because there's a myriad structures in the neck to, to draw our attention to. Bones, ligaments, discs, nerve roots, all sorts of things to blame problems on. But... That's, again, too short-sighted. You need to understand why all those things are irritated, not that they're irritated. And that's usually down to the shoulder blade system. And often the shoulder blade system is tied into posture strategy. And the shoulder blade system can even be linked to what's going on in the pelvis and lower body. And we can certainly talk about that if you want. So my first answer to that, and by the way, this also solves the dowager hump. In fact, um, I have a little video, I think it might be on YouTube now, I'm not sure, where I instantly fix someone's dowager hump in about 30 seconds uh, just by changing their posture strategy and their shoulder girdle strategy. You'll see the dowager hump basically completely disappear. And so um, that is also a biomechanical issue. So what's something simple they should try to do? Oh, okay. So uh, here... So this introduces the idea of a test retest. So let's say, what was the name again? Was it Gail? Uh, I'll look, but you can keep answering. Okay. All right. So let's say you have neck pain. And this is a concept that you can use anywhere for pain anywhere in the body. So let's say you have neck pain, though. And it hurts specifically when you turn your head to the left. All right. So this would be your test. Oh, when I turn my head to the left, and if it's about 30 or 40 degrees, that's when my pain starts. And my pain is about a 6 out of 10. OK, and that's very consistent. Oh, every time I go, there it is. There it is. So the exercise I would give you if you have neck pain or dowager's hump is to simply get on your hand on your hands and knees like this. I'll try and do it with my skeleton. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to sit back on your heels while your arms stay here. So as you sit back, the arms will be pulled overhead like this. All right. Now, what that's doing is fixing a fundamental problem temporarily of your shoulder blade system. So what you would do is then do this stretch and you can even walk your hands to the left and to the right to really stretch that out nicely. Come back up onto the hands and knees again and then do it one more time. Left, right, spend about a minute or so there, right? Stretching all that out. And you'll probably feel a lot of tightness in this armpit area, the shoulder blade area and the shoulder area for sure, all right? And then you get back up and you turn your head again to the left because that was your original test. What you're looking for is, can you move your head further now before pain? Or if your head moves to that 30 or 40 de degree angle, is your pain less? Or is your pain easy or uh, is your neck movement easier now? Or do you have to search more and wonder, oh, well, now I have to tilt my chin up to find that pain. There it is. OK, well, if you have to chill, tilt your chin, chin up, then then you're adding another series of uh, complexity to that test, which means that just turning like this again feels better. So you can use this technique, I, I call it test retest, for any exercise and any 
pain situation that you're in. For neck pain and headaches, it's often stretching out these muscles that are pulling the shoulder blades down will be the one thing that really unloads the neck and the, and the headaches for you. So try that out as a test retest option. So we got a question from Elizabeth here. So when bending repeatedly and lifting 10 plus pounds, we'll feel cracking in the tailbone area, unable to walk comfortably for a week or so. What is happening? Severe spinal stenosis. Okay, so severe spinal stenosis. So uh, spinal stenosis, we, we have this spinal cord coming down through the center column of our spine here. And what spinal stenosis is, is the encroachment of those vertebrae, the bone, you get bony growth that starts to pinch the spinal cord, all right? And usually the spinal stenosis is, has a label of uh, minimal, moderate, or severe. Severe spinal stenosis is, uh, you know, we have to be careful with that, but you can, I help a lot of people with severe spinal stenosis. Now, what's going on with spinal stenosis? Well, in general, just like what I talked about earlier, is that uh, with more extension of the spine or more arching, that irritates the spinal stenosis. So this goes back to my original idea that uh, low back pain, SI joint pain, sciatic pain, steno stenotic pain, it's all called different things, but it's all due to the same pattern, which is excessive arching of the spine or forces trying to create more arch in the spine. So the question, you know, outlines a behavior where it sounds like they're bending over like this, picking up a weight and coming back up. All right. So what most people are doing when they're doing this exercise is they are locking their spine into this arch position, bending over, hinging at the hip joint, which then length stretches their hamstring. Their spine shape has not changed. So they're still locked in that extended position. And then when they come back up, they're pulling from their hamstrings and the extended spine muscles here to come back up, which only deepens the pattern that's causing their pain in the first place. So what I would experiment with, and, and by the way, your back should feel much better when you're sitting, if you have severe spinal stenosis, because now you've removed the uh, extension stressors from your spine. So if that's the case, next time you bend over, start to learn how to bend your knees, right? But also flex the lumbar spine to bend over to allow more lumbar flexion. And I can almost guarantee what this will do is it's going to throw the, the work to your thigh muscles. And so when you bend your knees and flex your spine, your thigh muscles have to do more work instead of your back muscles. And so when you bend down and then come back up, keeping that flexed spine position and using your legs to come back up, you'll notice that your back feels much better when you do this. You might also notice, oh my gosh, my legs are super weak. That's really hard for me to do. Well, this may be, this weakness may be one of the reasons why you don't bend the knees in the first place and are hinging at your hips is because your thighs are too weak to bend down into a little squat like this. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense, Mike? Well, it makes sense to me, but I work in therapy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, our next question. So... Darlene says she tore her Achilles tendon. Any ideas for PT? Well, gosh. Uh, so is this a complete tear or a partial tear? Have you had surgery to repair the Achilles tendon? Um, so these are all questions I have. And then how did you tear it? Were you just like walking along or jogging lightly and then turning and, and tore it? Or did you have some violent accident that tore the, the Achilles? So all of these uh, speak to what has led to that tear in the first place. All right. So if it took very little to tear your Achilles tendon, or maybe you've had chronic Achilles issues or plantar fasciitis issues for a long time, and now you have an Achilles tendon tear, well, that shows you that there is a systems problem going on. Well, what could that be? Well, typically it's uh, excessive tightness in the calf and soleus complex. Uh, because these muscles down here, the calf and soleus, need to be long enough to allow the knee to bend over the foot like this when we're walking. And when they get too tight, then that doesn't bend and it throws the force back up to the ankle or the knee or the hip to, to accommodate. Well, this is what often leads to chronic Achilles tendon tears is that uh, this tightness 
it, it becomes too rigid down here. And so suddenly something happens that really requires that need to bend and it, you know, it's too tight. So it tears instead of just allows the bending to occur. So that's getting more into the why of the Achilles tearing. And if you've had a tear and repair, then you should be in PT right now. And what happens typically with Achilles tendon tears is that you're going to get worse before you get better. First, we have to let that tissue heal from the repair. And you're going to, your calf muscle is going to get very small. It's going to get weak. And then as the doctor allows more movement and load to occur, then you can start building up your strength again. But most Achilles tendon tears that I've seen, the calf and soleus complex doesn't really return to its the volume that it had before. The strength returns, the range of motion returns, but the look of the calf and soleus never looks quite the same. If that's what you're focusing on in terms of what do I need to do, then I, I would give up on that idea that I have to make my calf and soleus look exactly the same as the other side because it's, it's very unlikely that will happen. That's just how these things go mostly because of, I, I believe, a neurological uh, disconnect that's occurred because of the tear. Uh, we did have a question I'll answer. Someone was wondering about if they can watch this later. You do not have to watch it live. It'll still be on our Facebook later on Bob Brad. It's also on Rick Olderman's YouTube channel as well. So you can go over to Rick Olderman's YouTube channel and replay it later there if you don't have time right now. So our next question is... Hey, hey Mike, do you mind oh, yeah. if I interrupt this and spin the wheel to give out a free prize? Yes, you can give away free prize. Then Barbara okay. will get into your question. All right, you got you all can't see this, but I've got a roulette wheel with every one of your names who submitted an entry for a free prize on it. So I'm going to spin it right now. I don't. Can you hear that, Mike? No, this is very oh. anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm just going to call out the name. And so what I'm giving away, I've got copies of my books here, right? Various books to give away. I've got my somatics audio lessons to give away. And I've got some DVDs of my digital home programs to give away. So I'm going to be giving these things away. And who's the winner? Kara Moon. So Kara, we'll be contacting you. And I think Kara, what I'm going to give you is my back and sciatic pain DVD. So Kara, you're going to get that. All right. So we can get going and, uh, and, uh, Keep going now, Mike. And now I've written her down. So we'll continue back. on. We'll have to stop every couple of questions because you have a lot of stuff to give away there. I do. Yeah. And I want to give it away because I believe it's going to help people. And when I give away a book, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to give everyone a free somatics USB drive too. My, my somatics uh, information, there's the book. <laughs> my somatics information is not included in these books because they were written long ago before I became a HANA somatics practitioner. But I found that these, US, these somatics uh, lessons that I've created are the keys to unlocking the body, uh, the body's chronic tension that's often feeding pain. So Barbara's question is, do you believe that your approach can help a chronic neurological disorder such as cervical dystonia? I, I do. Uh, and, uh, you know, the reason, again, that is a component diagnosis. All right. And this is what I'm trying to get at is every, everyone on this call or listening to this has a different name for whatever they have, but it's all part of the same system of problems that everyone faces. It's just manifesting differently in their body as this dystonia versus neck pain versus headaches versus migraine headaches versus trigeminal neuralgia versus occipital neuralgia. All of those are the same irritation of things in the same system of problems. And frankly, the, the exercise I gave uh, about that test retest and then doing that all fours rocking stretch just a few minutes ago, that's the first one I would try to see if this has any merit for what you're doing. Your neck should feel almost immediately better after you do that little stretch, even if it's a smidge, because if you've only spent maybe a minute on that, on that stretch. So that to give you a clue that, oh my gosh, this can be changed. If this little stretch can change even just a little bit, then if I do that all the time, maybe I can change all of it. All right. Next question is from Jim. So he had a knee in October 22, has scar tissue on top knee, but especially on the lateral side of knee. So I'm guessing he wants help with some scar tissue adhesion breakup. Yeah. So uh, this is the difficult thing is, so 
a lot of people like Jim have been told that, oh, you're having knee pain because of scar tissue. So the question is, really, Jim, do you have knee pain? That's the thing that I care about because people will say this happens all the time. Pain is blamed on scar tissue that somehow appears out of nowhere and forms because of some problem. And, and then it's so your chronic pain is blamed on something you can't possibly change, right? Scar tissue. So are we trying to change the scar tissue or are we trying to change pain? If you're trying to change pain, we can definitely help you. I won't talk about specifically addressing scar tissue because that's often a false diagnosis that's given to things that people, other practitioners can't solve. I'd rather solve pain. And yes, you can fix that. So uh, Jim has knee pain. Let's see, scar tissue on top of the knee, especially the lateral side of the knee. So I'm going to wonder then if Jim has a chronic dislo or subluxation of his kneecap out to the side, which is a very common problem. And so because the kneecap uh, migrates to the outside, everyone says, oh, well, you've got chronic scar tissue that's pulling that out. Well, often that's not the case. So here's one reason why that's happening. This brings up, and this is also in the book, this idea that all thigh bones are not shaped the same. Some people's thigh bones are rotated out, which is called retroversion. And some people's thigh bones are rotated in, which is called antiversion. Most men tend towards retroversion and most females tend towards antiversion or rotated in. So what happens is, is that based on whatever shape of your thigh bone is, the, muscle, the, the, the bone is trying to rotate out or in, but you're not using your body in the way that your thigh bone is shaped. This then creates forces acting through the knee, the hip, the foot, the back, the pelvis, the SI joint, and so forth, that then cause things like these subluxations to occur chronically. If they're occurring chronically, it's because there's usually a biomechanical issue going on. Unless you have a diagnosis that this little ridge on the outside of the knee is non-existent, then the reason that this is migrating to the outside is typically due to something happening with the thigh bone rotating underneath the muscles that are holding this patella in place. If you fix the reason your thigh bone is rotating underneath those muscles, then you'll likely solve the reason this keeps subluxing out to the outside. Okay. Do you want to spin your wheel again and give away? A I would love to. Okay. I'm sorry it's anticlimactic, but it's very <laughs> exciting for me. We just so, can't see the wheel spinning. That's all yes. I was suggesting. Yeah. So, so this one is for a neck pain book. All okay. right. And with that, you're going to get your somatics uh, USB stick. So let's see what we who we've got here. Mitchell Hogarth. Okay. And folks, remember. Uh, that I can't ship outside of the U.S. So if you're living outside the U.S., um, I, I won't be able to ship these. So hopefully both Kara and Mitchell are in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, so our apologies if you're outside of the U.S., but. Yeah. Okay. okay. A long, we got a long question from Ivy here about IT band syndrome. So she says it causes knots between hips and knee. At night, the area gets very tender when I sleep on my left side. I can feel my leg contracting, especially when sitting for prolonged periods of time. I have tried stretching, but it does not help too much. Any suggestions to stretch that leg out and get rid of knots? Yes, yes, yes. So this, again, goes into the idea of for more retroversion and antiversion. So I, I, it's too... Too much for me to demonstrate how to test for for more antiversion and retroversion on this on this live event, but I have one stretch that I would ask you to try, and what I would ask you to do is I would like you to sit at the very edge of a table, so just your butt cheeks are at the very edge, and make sure the table can support your weight. So you can use a kitchen countertop, a dining room table, a picnic bench, something like that. You're going to lie back so that your knees, so that your back is on the ground and your knees are to your chest, and you can hold your knees with your hand. When you do that, what I'd like you to do is hold one knee now and then lower the other leg over the edge of the table with the knee bent at 90 degrees. Most people with IT band friction syndrome will notice that when their knee comes down, it's coming down into the outside of the pelvis. And that's because the, the IT band is too tight. 
And if they try to bring it, and, and so it may come down all the way to the table like this when it's out to the outside, but when you try to bring it straight down, you'll notice that the knee won't go as far. And you'll also notice that the knee hurts sometimes when you do this. What this is proving to you is that the IT band is too tight. This is the best way I found to stretch that IT band is that you do this stretch and you start with the leg out to the outside and, and you'll probably feel that your thigh muscles are, too, are, are uh, tight too. And this will stretch those out because what, one of the muscles that you're stretching, the tensor fascia lata, controls the IT band, okay? And the IT band inserts on the lower part of the lower leg. So if it's tight, what it's going to do is it's going to try and rotate that little lower leg to the outside. That creates this rotational torque at the knee joint, which is why the knee hurts when you're doing the stretch. So we start with it out to the outside to unload most of those forces, let it just be there, stretch gently. And then as you do this a little bit at a time, you'll notice over the next few days or a couple of weeks is that you'll be able to bring that leg in closer and closer to midline without any knee pain and without that uh, thigh tightness. Once that happens, a lot of that IT band issue should resolve for you. Of course, it could be due to biomechanics of how you're walking and other things, but this would be one stretch I would, I would start you with. So I'm going to do one more question from this live event at the moment. And then I think we'll get into some of the pre-submitted questions because I have quite a few comments of people asking to go over some of those. So for now, we'll pick Kathleen's here. So when and how long should someone wear an SI belt, if at all, getting SI injection on Friday, dealing with low back issues over 20 years, currently doing somatics and purchase Rick's second edition book. Okay, so again, this goes back to that test I, I talked about earlier with the leg straight versus knee bent. If your SI joint pain feels better with your knees bent, it means that you have excessive forces running from the legs that are acting on your pelvis and back, causing the SI joint pain and the back pain. Now, here's the really interesting thing. What most people and what most people have is an asymmetrical force acting through their back and pelvis. So that stretch I just showed a minute ago for the IT band where you lower one leg down. If you notice that one leg is tighter than the other when you do this stretch, that means that those are, all those muscles attached to this part of your pelvis. All right. This is the front of this of the spine. This is the front of your pelvis. So if you have one side of your thigh muscles that are tighter than the other, you're pulling harder on one side of the pelvis than the other. Well, that introduces rotational torque into the pelvis and SI joint. And this is why a lot of SI joint pain is occurring is because you have an asymmetrical tightness of the thigh muscles in the front of your legs that's then causing the torque to be con continually rotated. Well, guess what? If the pelvis is rotated, that means the spine is rotated too. So now you've got a permanently rotated spine, pelvis, and SI joint because of the tightness here. So I would start with that kind of stretch first as to identify whether there's an asymmetrical force pulling on your pelvis causing this. And then the other thing I would start doing is uh, I would go into that test of straight versus bent to see if you have another pattern going on, which is that of too much back arching. I can almost guarantee you do. And then the last thing I want to say about this is, is that I, I wonder if this person is a hypermobile person. And the test I've developed to, to quick and dirty test that I've developed to see whether someone is hypermobile is I just have them straighten their arms out to the sides with the palms up to the ceiling. If the elbows bend back uh, backwards at all, you can see like mine, mine barely straightened. But uh, a hypermobile person, will, their elbows will almost bend backwards. All right. This, the elbows are not designed to bend backwards. So this is an easy test to see whether your ligaments are too loose. The ligaments are the primary stabilizers of joints in our bodies. So if your body is already predisposed to issues because of hypermobility, then, the, then fixing these asymmetries in your body become even more important because it takes less to move your joint because of its hypermobility than it does someone who doesn't have loose ligaments. Uh, I guess I just want to pop up this question so you can answer it quick. Is the discount on the book only for the ebook? Thought you said Amazon, but it says Google Play. Yeah. So uh, my publishing company wasn't able to get Amazon to lower their Kindle price. So what this the ebook is also on on Google. So they were able to get the price lowered on Google. 
So that's why, uh, contrary to what the email said, because uh, they assured me it would be no problem. <laughs> but of course it is. So now we've had to go with uh, the Google platform to purchase this with, for a discount rather than uh, Amazon. Okay, gotcha. Do you want to spin your wheel again and give away a prize oh, sure. quick? Yeah. Okay. So spinning the wheel. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, a hip pain DVD for this person. And by the way, uh, these are, this is a DVD of my digital home program. I no longer offer the DVDs, So these are nearly extinct. And, uh, but Collectors all of my digital home programs include the somatics audio lessons that I was mentioning earlier. So the winner of the hip pain DVD is Sharon Nelson. So I'm going to write that down. And then, uh, what we'll do is that'll be the hip pain DVD. Um, Congratulations, was... Sharon. I like to say that a lot of these exercises Rick is talking about, Bob has took his course for PTs, and we present a lot of it in our current Bob and Brad videos. So a lot of what Rick is teaching, a lot of what we teach now is actually from Rick. So if the skeleton is confusing to you, you can watch the videos because we kind of show them with real humans, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm going kind of fast because no, it's fine. We have over 600 questions. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to look over some of your questions from emails quick to go over? Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Well, I, I, I wanted to start with this one. It, it's a beautiful question. And I, I just feel it, it's deserving of uh, an answer. And the question is simply this why do we have chronic pain? And I wanted to start with that. I kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the, of the session is that we have chronic pain. You all are suffering from all of these various conditions because of how we've been trained in medicine to look at things from this component standpoint. Now I'm not dissing component approaches because we solve a lot of difficult, acute issues with component thinking. It's great for sprains, tears, breaks, you know, any kind of acute or short-term issue. This is exactly how you want to solve that kind of pain. The problem is chronic pain plays by different rules. If it's chronic, it means that there is a larger issue going on. That issue may relate to older injuries that you have. And this is the thing that I think is really interesting for me as a practitioner. When I talk to people about their, their issues, and I asked them about old, old injuries, nearly everyone says, I have no older injuries. But then once we start working together and I say, but, but why is this happening? Oh, well, that's because I broke that ankle back when I was in high school. Well, I'm sorry, that's an older injury. So that <laughs> all matters, right? So we're not, you're not trained to think about your old injuries as the precursors to your current pain. But I can almost guarantee it is. And those old injuries, even though they're not painful, be, them not being painful has nothing to do with that system being working correctly because your brain has created these uh, compensation patterns to get around the problems that you've created in your life up until now. And now what, what chronic pain is saying is, hey, I have no more compensations to give. We've got to finally address this as a system because I'm out of options now. And frankly, this is what really the answer to that question I just brought up is, why do we have chronic pain? Is that we have chronic pain because of all of these, a lifetime of these compensations occurring for older issues that have never quite been resolved correctly. And so they're finally, there's a straw that breaks the camel's back and you wonder, gosh, I just fell. Why do I have chronic back pain now? Because of your life leading up to that fall has created the body that fell and now that whole system that has just tumbled over your, your house of cards. Do you want me to ask a question from here? Do you want to keep going from that list? Well, uh, I'd love to get into the book a little bit. If oh, you, sure. Go ahead. If you want to do that. So uh, I, I ha I've like had a few passages from the book. So I, I don't know. I, I just wanted to read a couple to give people an idea of what's in the book. So, um, so they can understand you know, sure. and get an idea. So um, this is from the, the, let's see. Do you have any topic that you're particularly interested in, Mike? I think you've read the book, right? 
I have the book. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> oh, Mike. Thanks for, thanks for preparing for this event. Uh, Bob has read it. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's talk to, uh, about migraines for a second. So I'm just going to um, read this short little passage. This is from chapter two, Summoning Migraines. So Debbie, a longtime friend of ours, had been involved in a pair of automobile accidents that left her with chronic migraine headaches. She'd suffered for years before my wife convinced her that I might be able to help. It hadn't occurred to her that migraines could be caused by a musculoskeletal problem, but medication wasn't working well enough and wasn't a long-term solution. If headaches are like mountains, then mount migraines are like K2, the second highest mountain in the world. They aren't your run-of-the-mill headaches. They're fraught with all sorts of additional symptoms, including throbbing, nausea, and even vomiting. They can include changes in eyesight, such as hearing, seeing auras or blind spots. Similarly, tingling on one side of the face can linger for several days. Interestingly, they're all, they often occur on one side of the head. To me, this is a key attribute. In my simple way of looking at things, I see migraines as being on a headache spectrum, something that isn't mentioned in most research on headaches. Of course, at one end of the spectrum are the people who rarely get a headache, perhaps once a year, and it passes rapidly. On my headache mountain analogy, these people are out for a little hike in the foothills, some up and down, but nothing too strenuous. And then somewhere in the middle, there are those with diagnoses of tension headaches, which are more frequent, intense, and longer lasting. These can range from the Appalachian Mountains to Mount Kilimanjaro, the third largest mountain in the world. Getting closer to the other end of the spectrum are migraines. And then finally, the ultimate is trigeminal neuralgia, the Mount Everest of head pain, and one of the most painful conditions in the musculoskeletal system known to exist. Why do I see all of these in this, on the same spectrum? Because my treatment approach to normal headaches also works very well for migraines. I've even helped a few cases of trigeminal neuralgia that have come my way. So the source of the problem seems to be very similar, if not the same. Instead, it's a matter of degree. Migraines and trigeminal neuralgia both seem to happen mostly on one side of the head or face. Why would this be? In my experience, it's due to asymmetries in arm function due to handedness, past injuries that weren't adequately solved, and posture patterns, such as having a rounded mid-back, faulty postural training, and or work-related postural issues. Of course, most medical practitioners will dismiss this interesting attribute as unimportant because they don't understand the connections between the arm and head or neck as a potential source of pain. When I hear of musculoskeletal pain, no matter where it is in the body, as being unilateral, I automatically think I might be able to solve it. If it's on both sides, this can indicate a more systemic origin, such as a nervous system disorder, blood-borne disorder like, di like a disease process, spinal disorder, or some other issue not directly related to muscles, tendons, and bone. That doesn't mean I won't try to help someone with bilateral symptoms. It just means my radar is turned to a high sensitivity in these cases to things that don't fit into my treatment paradigm. And then it goes on to talk about how I solve Debbie's headaches using this systems approach. Should we, uh, do you want to spin for another prize? How many prizes do we have to give away yet? We have a lot. Okay, let's do another spin quick. All we'll right. do a few more questions and you can do another sure. reading passage. Uh, if you're just tuning in, Rick is giving away some of his products. So he's got a little spinning wheel that we can't see. But well, see, I think uh, I'm going to give away the, uh, the, since I just read something about migraines, I'm going to give away the Heal Your Headaches digital program as a DVD. So this goes to Rick Hoekstra. Okay, Rick. I like your name. <laughs> Is that why you picked it? <laughs> this is all rigged. All right. <laughs> all right. Neck DVD. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Congratulations, Rick. Jeanette says, I feel a, and I'm guessing a slightly tore muscle and rotator cuff, but why does this pain in my shoulder flare when I use my fingers in small motor movements? Yeah. So, uh, so the, so this gets into kind of what I touched on earlier with neck pain and headaches is that while you may have a rotator cuff tear, all right, this shoulder blade is the foundation for all upper body movement. 
And so when the shoulder blades rules are broken, then problems happen either in the neck or head or in the shoulder, elbow and hand. So my guess is that you have a shoulder blade dysfunction that has probably led to the rotator cuff tear in the first place. And that when you use your small motor movements here, the foundation of your system isn't correct so that it's irritating the shoulder or the hand or wherever else down the chain when you're even doing small motions. So that would be my, I mean, immediately I would look at your shoulder blade as the source of this problem if I were seeing you uh, as a patient. And that's probably what the cause is. Okay. So Kathy kind of has a generic question. What is your take on twisting motion? I'm presuming of the spine. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, I I'm always nervous with twisting motions of the spine. That's the most aggressive motion you can do. And so, uh, that's often the last thing I ask any back sciatic, SI joint, pelvic pain, whatever per person to do are twisting. Now, uh, so that's my basic take on it because basically it's causing more compression. And what I have seen, uh, Kathy, is that most people have so many asymmetries in their body that are creating asymmetrical torque running through the pelvis and back that one, one side of rotation may be just fine and you feel hunky-dory, but going to the other side is extremely painful. And this is indicating that you have an asymmet asymmetrical use or tightness pattern or usage pattern or chronic tension pattern happening in your legs that's, that's playing out in your spine. So um, if you're having problems twisting, then that's probably what's going on. But frankly, uh, it's, it's not, twisting is not something I try to get my patients back to ever, unless they're golfers or something like that, because it's so egregious to the spine and pelvis. There's so many things that have to happen correctly for twisting to be a good thing for the body. It often isn't. So Darlene has a follow-up question who had the Achilles tendon tear for clarification for you. So what do you mean by neurological tear with my Achilles tendon? I did not have surgery and it was last October. The injury took place just while walking across the street. Okay. So this is kind of what I, I, I was kind of talking about. So uh, but the fact that you didn't have surgery means it was likely a partial tear. And let's see, when did it happen? Last October. Last October. So that should be healed by now. And so uh, you can confirm, Darlene, whether it's healed. So if you were just walking across the street, and that's a fairly innocuous event, that means that you have a larger systemic problem going on. And that uh, speaks really to what I was just describing, is that your calf soleus complex is likely to excessively tight on that side, leading up to that event, which is why it tore. Now, there's lots of permutations of that. But what I meant, your question, I think, was, what do I mean by neurological uh, uh, feedback? Well, the neurological issue is happening usually with a complete tear. You didn't have that, so I'm not as worried about that for you. But what I, what I would assume is that you have an asymmetrical use of your body, which has led to maybe an asymmetrical tightness in your calf soleus complex, uh, which is then the one that got torn. So hopefully that answers your question there. Okay, so Barbara is talking about, Rick, please explain how Hannah Somatics fits beautifully into the systems approach. I personally use Somatics combined with Sue Hitzman's MELT method. If possible, please comment about MELT. Into this, okay, so, all right, this is a great question. Who is this? Hey, Barbara, that's a great question. So I'm so glad someone asked this. All right, so um, one of the things that, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a long answer, but it's, it's going to be okay, we'll get through it. All right, so fascia in the body is connective tissue. And Thomas Myers, who is one of the leading researchers in fascia, identified that we have these super highways of fascia that run from our head to our toes, all right? And what it turns out is that chronic tension patterns seem to be occurring through over these fascial super highways. And I can go into the reasons for for that, but I won't, it's getting too technical. But anyway, so HANA somatics addresses chronic pain tension patterns. And so what the, the eight somatics lessons that I have in my programs do is that they will release chronic tension that's occurring through throughout these super highways of fascia. 
some there's one in the back, there's one in the side, there's a couple in the front, there's a rotational one, there's there's a super highway in the arms and so forth. So that's why I've included them in my program, because fascia, by definition, is a systems structure because it's, it's crossing so many joints and tissues and involving so many tissues. And so the somatics does beautifully of reducing that chronic tension that's occurring through that whole pattern of issues. I've also often found that people with chronic pain need to first begin with somatics uh, exercises to reduce the chronic tension in their bodies so that they can then start stretching and strengthening to solve the biomechanical problems in their bodies. If you try to stretch a muscle that's tense, it'll just get tight again because it's not really tight, it's tense. It's your brain trying to contract that muscle. So if you don't involve your brain in releasing the tension of that muscle, you can stretch that muscle all day long and it'll just be tense the next day or tight the next day. This is the reason is because you're trying to stretch a, a contracted muscle, not a tight muscle. A contracted muscle presents as a short muscle, just like a tight muscle does. All right. Next question. We'll do one more question. We'll do another giveaway quick. So Mary Ann, is pain when standing up for more than a few minutes? Okay. When sitting help. Yes. Well, uh, Mary Ann, <laughs> this is exactly what I was talking about before. So, uh, if you remember and listen to uh, what we talked about with lying down with your legs straight versus knees bent, you're one of those people whose back feels much better when your knees are bent. It's the same thing with standing. I, Pain happens here, but it feels better when I'm sitting down, all right? It's the same principle that you're ba back when you're sitting, you're, what you're doing is you're removing the forces from your legs that are causing the spine to become too arched. When you remove those forces, your pelvis and spine resume the position and the orientation that they are natural to them and that make them feel better. And that's why your back feels better sitting versus standing. So one of the main forces that's causing this, if you simply start unlocking your knees when you're standing and walking, you will notice, in fact, let's try this right now as a little test. If you stand right now, Marianne, and feel and lock your knees back, you'll feel that your back is more arched. If you simply unlock your knees, you'll feel your back is less arched. If you can't feel that, then lock the knees one more time and you'll definitely feel it's more arched. Well, you've just told me that when your back is more arched, it's more painful. So this is a perfect example of how one of your unconscious behaviors is feeding into your pain. Your unconscious behavior is the fact that you are locking your knees when you're standing and walking, which every time you step then is a little hammer that's hammering on your back because it's causing a little extension moment to occur in your back. So do you want to give away another prize, Rick? I would love to. It's too bad you can't hear the spe the wheel spin. Uh, I need game show music here. It's it's gripping. Okay, so this one I'm going to give away my foot and ankle pain book, and then you'll also get uh, the USB drive, the Somatics USB drive for that one as well. And this is going to go to Catherine Sebastian. All right, Catherine, congratulations, and we'll be contacting you soon regarding that. Um, All right. Do you want to do another passage from your book quick? Yeah. Um, sure. When I was looking over the book that I didn't quite read yet, uh, there's a chapter called Naked and Afraid, so that intrigued me. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's that yeah. story about? Yeah. Um, let's see. I've, I've got that in here. And what that is is uh, it's about the first time I published one of my books. So let's see if I can find that. And um, – here it is. I've got a passage from that. So, so basically, folks, uh, what you're seeing right now is me getting up in front of you. And I don't know whether it looks smooth or not, but this is not my the typically how I've conducted my life. Usually, I'm just used to working in my little cave of a clinic and paying attention only to my patients and helping them. So at some point, I realized I needed to step out of that comfort zone and, and start trying to help other people. And my first uh, attempt at doing that was writing my neck pain book. All right. And so this chapter naked and afraid is uh, 
talking about the reason why I I finally realized I needed to write my neck pain book. Naked and Afraid is basically a dream I had where I was playing guitar naked up on stage. <laughs> uh, after after I, I I published this book on Amazon, I, I was terrified, and it was just me feeling exposed. Right, so that's that's where that dream came from. But here's here's what I'd like to read from this first chapter. After a few years of working as a PT, I discovered workshops put on by Dr. Shirley Saruman, a professor of physical therapy at Washington University in St. Louis. With her information, my results got better and better. She helped me make sense of the connections I discovered in my patients. There was a physical therapist I struck up a friendship with at the seminars and ran into him one day. How are you finding the information? I asked him. Oh, I'm just taking bits and pieces, he said. I'm more of a manual therapist and I don't see a use for a lot of it. I don't think patients will buy into it. A manual therapist is one who typically focus on, focuses on joint manipulations like a chiropractor. But it really works well, I said. I'm getting great results. My patients seem to love it. He shrugged dismissively. With that shrug, I realized that Dr. Saruman's information was being filtered through therapists who might not embrace it. The full impact of her great work wouldn't be delivered to patients who needed it. Many who live in rural communities like the one I grew up in and worked in and may have only access to one or possibly two therapists for help. This is true of all professions. We tend to apply information that fits our training or personality and discard the rest. Because I had been so unsuccessful as a therapist, I had no allegiance to competing approaches I'd already tried, including manual therapy. They just didn't seem to work well, or at least as well as I thought they should. I embraced Dr. Saruman's philosophy because it worked in the broadest populations and across a wide spectrum of injuries. It combined an understanding of the nuts and bolts of anatomy, neurology, and biomechanics with movement habits. It was perfect for me. Okay, I'm going to do a couple more questions here, and we'll do another giveaway, and then I think we'll wrap stuff up slowly after that. So I apologize to people. There's lots of questions. We'll maybe try to schedule another live event for the future. So uh, I wanted to also talk about that for just a second, Mike. I'm going to do my best to answer all of these questions I've received uh, for this, and I'll be posting these uh, answers on my YouTube channel. So folks, if you want to go to my YouTube channel, I'll create videos and I'll, I'll give them to you, Mike, too. And you guys can post them if you want to. But um, uh, I'm going to do my best to answer all your questions because I, I, I think it's important. And I'll try to go into better detail than I have tonight because I've been trying to hurry to get through as many as I can. So just to let you know. Uh, yeah, we've done live events with you or not live events. But if you pick a, a certain body part and just stick to that, it usually goes a little smoother. It's kind of yeah, hard. I may do it like that. Your yeah. body. So, uh, I think this will be good for you. So she meant to say PT. She commented later, but I've never been to PT. How do I find a good one? Well, you can see Rick actually. Rick, do you want to tell them how they can do that? Well, <laughs> uh, if you go to rickolderman.com, uh, you can schedule an appointment with me. However, um, that can, that's kind of expensive. So this is exactly why I created my digital home programs because for, I, literally, for the last three years, every recommendation I've given anyone who's ever seen me in a telehealth visit or Zoom session is already found in my di digital home programs. And so it would save you a lot of time and money just purchasing one of those, which you can also purchase uh, by going to my website under the products tab. But you can certainly schedule an appointment with me if you want. But I can almost guarantee you, you're going to get exactly what's already in my digital programs. And also what's nice about my digital programs is that you have an opportunity to communicate with me uh, in, even with a digital program. So because I've created coaching calls, group coaching calls where, you know, everyone gets a free one. And if you want more, you can buy a package or something. But anyway, you have the opportunity to ask questions specific to your issues in these group coaching calls. And so that's where you can also get, and it's much cheaper than an individual session with me. So uh, that's, that's how you can get individual time with me if you want to. Uh, next question. I don't think you have a favorite pillow, but the person's asking they're having neck pain while sleeping. Any pillow recommendations? Yeah. So I, this is because I get lot, these questions lots of times. And my, my answer is fix the neck that's, that's going to bed and the pillow won't matter nearly as much. And so the neck pain that you're having, and the reason why you feel you need that neck pain pillow 
It's because of a systemic breakdown in your upper body system. You can solve that. And I, I can show you how in my digital program or, you know, uh, privately, if you want a private session. But my answer is let's fix the system so the pillow doesn't matter so much. And I say that this also with people who are asking for bed recommendations or, you know, all sorts of things. So if you fix your body, these kinds of things don't matter. But to answer your question more directly, no, I don't have a specific pillow recommendation for your neck. I assume if you have neck pain, you've probably played around with all of them already. Uh, last question I'm picking from here is diagnosed with ulnar nerve issues that cause numbness in my left hand, pinky, and side of hand. I did PT summer month, but I found no relief and have been living with it for years. Oh, gosh, this is fascinating. Uh, let's see, Sue, the very last uh now, I've, I've solved a lot of ulnar pain in the past, but my very last uh, um, chapter in my book is of someone who had ulnar, ulnar nerve pain, and I couldn't solve it. And it shows all the things that I, I, looked, I tried to do to help solve this person's pain. And ultimately, I believe it wasn't due to the ulnar nerve uh, problem. It was due to something else that was irritating the ulnar nerve that wasn't a part of the normal system of things that irritate the ulnar nerve. So most people who have ulnar nerve pain, I, I'm sure you've had your neck checked out, thoracic outlet syndrome checked out, uh, pectoralis minor checked out. I'm sure you've had your tarsal tunnel syndrome, tarsal tunnel syndrome checked out. I'm sure you've, you know, had your wrist checked out for a potential ulnar nerve compression there. Uh, and you can have a nerve conduction velocity test that, that, uh, identifies areas of impingement on the ulnar nerve all the way up the chain into the neck. So I'm assuming you've had all of that. And if you haven't, then that's where I would begin is to get a nerve conduction velocity test and have an MRI of your neck and, and brachial plexus area to see if you have a neck vertebrae that's compressing this, uh, you know, um, uh, a rib that's compressing the, the a branch of the ulnar nerve, your pectoralis minor that's uh, compressing a branch of the ulnar nerve. But I, I tried all of this with this other person and I went down a very deep and long rabbit hole trying to find what was causing this thing for this one patient. And it's the one patient that haunts me still that I haven't solved their pain. And one of the reasons I wrote this book was I was hoping a practitioner would read it and know what was going on. But anyway, that's where I would start with you is getting a nerve conduction velocity test. And also, I'm going to guess most practitioners do not address the shoulder blade as the source of potential compression for the ulnar nerve. And if you haven't had that done, then I would ask your physical therapist or whomever to address the shoulder girdle system. Unfortunately, most physical therapists don't understand how the shoulder girdle systems work correctly. But uh, I address that in my shoulder and elbow pain book and also my neck pain books if you want to get a book and my heal your headaches program or neck pain program and my digital programs. And in the digital pain programs, I also show a taping technique you can do to immediately fix the shoulder girdle system to see if that eliminates your ulnar nerve pain uh, immediately. So uh, there's a few things to, that you can start thinking about. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Rick. Do you want to give away any more prizes here? Or? Oh, I'll give away one more prize. Let's see. Uh, well, since we just talked about shoulder pain, I don't think I've given away a shoulder pain book. I'm going to give away a shoulder pain book now and uh, one of these somatics uh, USB drives. So here we go. Hold on to your, your hats here. <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> okay. So this is shoulder pain. Very high tech. You can, you can see. <laughs> so um, who's the winner? Yeah. Okay. I, I wish you could hear this mic because it even has applause and, and celebration in the band, like confetti, all sorts of stuff. So this is great. Barb Cameron is getting the shoulder pain book. So congratulations, Barb. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us. I apologize. We had a lot of questions to go through. Uh, if you like this live event, you can let us know and maybe we can plan one for the future. We'll probably try to get more specific to a certain uh, area of the body to talk about. So it'll be a little more understandable, I should say. And then also folks, I just want to reiterate 
The ebook price is reduced right now, but it's only temporary. Uh, I think everyone should have received the, the Google link to get that at its temporarily reduced price. That will be ending very, very soon. And uh, if you haven't gotten that ebook uh, link yet, please contact us at support at rickolderman.com and we'll send you that link as quickly as possible. And in case you missed the part earlier, Rick's going to take a chunk of the questions that were sent by email previously and answer them on his own uh, YouTube channel if you're watching this from the Bob and Brad side. So, all right. Well, thanks, Rick, for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me and say hello to Bob and Brad for me. I will. See ya.